Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Mandrela, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central America. It is a pleasure to be here at the Central America Donors Forum, such an important venue for experts to come together to share work, discuss challenges, opportunities, big ideas, ways to operationalize them, and to cultivate partnerships. Most of all, it's a pleasure to be here with actors that are committed to Central America, to its people, and to efforts to lift Central America up. For lasting, equitable growth that will give Central Americans the hope they need to build a future at home, the region needs broad engagement, not just from donors, but from civil society and the private sector. In July, the U.S. government released a new root causes strategy for Central America. The strategy identifies, prioritize, and prioritizes and coordinates government actions to improve conditions in the region. It has five pillars, each of which reinforces the other. Uh, addressing economic insecurity and inequality, combating corruption, strengthening democratic governance and advancing the rule of law, promoting respect for human rights, labor rights, and a free press, countering and preventing violence, extortion, and other crimes perpetrated by criminal gangs, trafficking networks, and other organized criminal organizations, combating sexual, gender-based, and domestic violence. We recognize the central importance of tackling corruption, strengthening governance, and driving private sector investment to create the conditions for Central Americans to build their futures at home rather than attempting to immigrate to the United States. Our efforts seek to achieve long-term sustainable changes to help bring Northern Central America out of the cycle of poor governance, weak, sec weak security, and economic stagnation, which has driven migration for decades. It's possible that people think of private sector engagement as only fitting into the first pillar of the root causes strategy, focused on addressing economic insecurity and inequality. But it's really important to understand, and I think all of us here do understand, that the private sector benefits from improvements in governance and security and has a direct impact on labor rights. In addition, positive change in one area can create positive change in the others. And we are absolutely committed to, throughout all of the pillars of our strategy, to address governance um, issues at, at the core of our efforts. Today, we have brought together a diverse group of people to talk about the ways that the private sector and civil society organizations can create positive change in Central America. Some of this is through direct advocacy, and some organizations are taking bold steps on their own to impact their spheres of influence. It's critical that organizations that invest in Central America across all sectors also advocate for governance reforms. The U.S. government, the private sector, and civil society can and should have a unified message when we advocate for investment climate reforms in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And we should be specific when we talk about the tangible benefits governance reforms would bring. Additionally, companies can and should be conducting business in a way that creates positive change. This is something the panelists here today know very well. For instance, companies can refuse to do business with corrupt actors and cannot object to efforts that their workforce, uh, for, of their workforces to unionize. In these ways, the private sector can quickly have a positive impact, not only on the economic systems, but also on the broader society. Here with us today are representatives of companies and organizations who are already working in this area. They're using their relationships with other leaders to advocate for change and expand economic opportunity in the region. I am pleased to introduce today's panelists. First, Ambassador Luis Arriaga is a retired career diplomat and the former United States Ambassador to Guatemala. Masayo Garcia is the Director of Government, Government Engagement at MasterCard, where she works with governments to improve digitalization in government. Maria Fernandez Rivera is a businesswoman and president of Guatemala's National Business Council, an organization that advocates for reforms that improve the business climate. And Jonathan Porter is the executive director of the Partnership for Central America, where he coordinates new business investments in Central America while advocating for improved governance. Today, we are pleased to hear from each of our panelists um, and some questions that I will pose at the top, and then we will move into um, a period of discussion and would welcome uh, questions from uh, participants as well. I'm first going to start with Masayo Garcia from MasterCard. Um, we, we all know that digital innovation can have direct impact on, um, on efforts to improve transparency. And I would like to hear from you, Masayo, in your experience, what's the most useful digital innovation that the private sector has used to improve efficiency and promote growth? 
which has also led to greater governmental transparency. Amy, thanks a lot. It's an honor to be here in the Central America Donors Forum. And uh, as you may know, we have been joining this great effort from the government of the United States, the North Triangle Initiative, and we are committed to work in these topics in the region. Here, I want to start talking about financial inclusion. This is a topic that is definitely in our core. And um, why I'm going to bring this topic here, because we think we have this strong belief that everyone in Central America deserves access to financial services, regardless of the level of income, the religion, the gender, anything. Everyone can have access. And why? Because we have understood that financial inclusion is an enabler and is part of the global sustainable development goals. In many cases, when we talk about financial inclusion, we relate that just with a card or with a bank account. But for us, beyond payment, financial inclusion is an enabler to access credits, to access insurance, to access uh, the possibility of having savings. And after all, empowering this business micro businesses, small businesses, connecting them with the global economy. So at the end, it's like improving lives and promoting development across the countries, across the region. So here, as, as I said, we think that we have to go beyond the financial service itself and approach this topic uh, as, an, as the impact it has on the economy itself. As I said, we think that having financial inclusion is not going just to promote having savings in the economy, but also is going to lower the price of the credits, is going to promote the possibility for people to have a credit score. So access to potential credits to really grow their businesses, to grow their, their economic possibilities, and also to really um, push away informality that is really normally in cash, and is not really conducive to the possibility of social development. But how can we help to bring these solutions? What are we doing at MasterCard? We have financial inclusion as a priority since, I don't know, back in, 20, in 2012. Um, and we have been lots of efforts around this, but we have found that across Latin America, the percentage of population that is excluded from the, from the financial services is around 45. And just to give you an example, in the case of Guatemala, is over 50%. And when we go to women, it's even worse because we have found that there is a gap between the reality of men and women that can be in, in between 10 and 50%. So here we have a huge possibility, a huge opportunity to collaborate, to create solutions and to improve the possibility of this population to get access to the financial services. We have this commitment in MasterCard to get to 1 billion people included globally. And in the case of Latin America, the number is 100 million people uh, over the next five years. So we are going to work that. And definitely, the North Triangle Initiative is going to be the place to bring these numbers into the region. We have uh, definitely achieved these goals by partnering with the fintech ecosystem, empowering fintechs and enabling them to be part of this, to provide agile and low cost solutions to bring these people into the system. We have partnered definitely with the private sector, going to your point. And um, another topic that is being critical is not just relying on the private sector that can bring uh, innovation, digital payment solution, technology can push the numbers or the cost lower, but also uh, with, the with the public sector. Governments are critical here in enabling changes in behavior in this population are really helping us to create these um, use cases for them to really understand why it's useful to have financial inclusion and how can they make the best for them in these cases. And to your second topic, and actually the most important here is um, transparency. Why? a financial inclusion attached to transparency. Because we have a concept that I don't know you are aware and is the shadow economy. We understand the shadow economy in all these transactions, all these movements of money that are not 
um, over the table that are, that are not registered, that doesn't have any traceability. And when you have these um, windows, you can open the possibility to have corruption, to have a delinquency, to have um, different illegal activities. Um, and of course, not having access for the government. It is, it is critical to really link financial inclusion with having um, a better result in terms of shadow economy. And we think that governments should work, with that, work there. How? Promoting electronic payment, definitely. Trying to have the government as the enabler of these changes, having all these payments going digital and to a bank account, having, for instance, all the subsidies, the strategy, uh, going to a bank account, having all the salaries payments via bank account, having um, the, all the possibilities of tax and also the tax payments uh, doing being paid digital. So here, they are really creating this change in behavior. They are really creating the opportunity and showing the, the citizens how can they make the best of this and definitely relying in the possibility of having a regulation that allow us to bring these new players in the ecosystem and building a strong financial infrastructure um, in order to, to build these solutions. So that's why we think financial inclusion is a key player. Governments are key players here, of course, to enabling these changes. And definitely the alliances between public and private sector is going to help us to really create these changes in the countries of the Central America. Thank you so much, Masayo. So financial inclusion, uh, the role of the government, uh, uh, partnerships between public and private, um, and, uh, uh, and and promises of greater transparency. I think that was re a really great way to kick off the, the panel. And I'm gonna turn to Ambassador Ariaga now to ground through some of that. We are really privileged to have you on the call, Ambassador Ariaga, especially given your recent um, experience in Guatemala as the US ambassador to Guatemala. Uh, I imagine from that perch, you engaged a lot with U.S. businesses that were interested in investing in Central America and in Guatemala in particular. And I'm curious, um, uh, from your perspective, what can governments do to improve the attractiveness of Central America as an investment destination in general? And I believe you're on, on mute, Ambassador. Okay, got it. Done. So uh, first of all, I want to thank the Seattle International Foundation and other sponsors for organizing this uh, event and for inviting me to participate. Regarding your, your question, Emily, uh, I, it would be important to perhaps turn that around and ask ourselves, what do we think uh, foreign investors would like governments to do to make their countries more attractive for investment? And I think we can provide the answers in three separate baskets, rule of law, regulatory infrastructure. Let's start with rule of law and the premise that most foreign investors are not going to go and risk their capital in places where the rule of law does not prevail. What most investors and citizens would want is having a set of justice sector institutions that are independent, capable, and respected. This would also require having governments outside the judiciary behave in a way where they respect the decisions of uh, the judiciary and they do not attempt to manipulate it. So if you look at the situation in the region, I think it's easy to reach the conclusion that most, if not all, of those conditions are not being met. Now, as to the specific steps that government, governments can take on the issue of rule of law, there have been many practical, thoughtful, and, and, and very useful initiatives that have been put forward by various institutions, think tanks, NGOs, civil society, but unfortunately, they have not prospered because it appears as if governments are not really interested in that. So, um, but the proposals are there, and, and I think it, you don't have to look very far to find them. 
I have seen up close how foreign investors struggle with weak justice institutions. And in many cases, they have decided not to make additional investments because it is not worth their trouble since they don't know how their disputes or issues will be, will be handled. Uh, in terms of the regulatory basket, uh, I think uh, you know, foreign investors want to have a level playing field and they want to have clear rules of the game. I can speak a little bit about the situation in Guatemala where they're having many proposals by foreign investors, domestic investors, and, and they have identified areas where regulatory attention is needed. Let me start with competition laws. They want to have a level playing field. Labor laws, labor laws that address the issue of part-time work and telework. They want a tax administration system that is transparent, uh, efficient, and predictable. They would like an intellectual property rights legislation welcomes investment in that very important area that protects that investment. They're also looking for trade uh, regulations that facilitate the movements of goods and services without requiring uh, you know, bribes or other, other ways to get, get around the system. And most importantly, uh, this is something uh, that addresses some of the, the uh, issues addressed uh, by the earlier speaker is they would love to have an electronic financial transactions infrastructure that, that is transparent and that eliminates, eliminates the opportunities for corruption. Infrastructure is the third basket where government intervention can have a huge impact in attracting investment. Again, there have been plenty of studies that have identified the onerous impact that the current state of roads, bridges, and ports is having on businesses. Similarly, there have been studies that have identified the lack of investment in education, health, technical training as a major impediment of having a trained labor force, which most investors want. Again, the solution to these problems have been identified. Uh, there have been proposals, but uh, governments or certain branches of government don't seem willing to, to move forward. There is a certain case in Guatemala where legislation that would establish a public-private partnership to build a critical and needed road to a port did not get past the Guatemalan Congress. And it's beyond me why something like that would not prosper. So I, I would end my intervention that saying that to governments in the region that no one is asking them to fix everything at once. That of course would be impossible. It would be unrealistic. But I think what foreign investors, domestic investors and citizens want are concrete and credible steps and signs that there is a commitment to address all of these gaps in these three baskets. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ariaga, um, and, and thanks for sharing your experience too, um, and, and tying that back to the to the conversation at hand, um, especially given the engagement that you've had with with U.S. businesses. And, and sticking with that that theme, we're going to go over to Jonathan Ventini Porter. Um, Jonathan, can you tell us a bit about the Partnership for Central America? I know um, through that forum, you're working with interested companies to bring investment to the region. What are you hearing from them about the need for increased transparency in Central America? Um, I imagine that some of the points that Ambassador Ariaga just made are being uh, reiterated by companies in your day-to-day -day engagement. It would be really helpful for us to hear their perspectives. Certainly. Uh Deputy Assistant Secretary Mandrell, thanks so much, and, and thanks very much to the Foundation as well for bringing us together. Um, so, in short, the, the Partnership for Central America is a coalition that was launched by Vice President Harris in June to drive more than a billion dollars in private sector investments and commitments to the region. And uh, at this point, uh, coming out of the initial launch, were 75 businesses across the Fortune 500 list connecting organizations in the private sector with impact in the region. Uh, it's a region, of course, from a private sector perspective, as Ambassador Ariaga noted, um, that is in many ways challenged by so many of the, the critical governance pillars that are needed to support long-term private sector investment. 
So with these 75 businesses focused on delivering impact in the region, focused on delivering sustainable businesses in the region, we're cut across seven core pillars, digital inclusion, financial inclusion, manufacturing, education, energy, and rule of law. Working across these, the focus is measurable impacts on the ground for families and really to create an environment that supports them staying in and creating an, an, an environment that allows them to have the hope to stay in their homes. In addition to, the, to these key impact areas, we're also working on focusing on vulnerable populations. So this includes working with Care International, for example, who's leading the gender equity pillar of this effort. It's working with partners across sustainability to support climate resilience. And so across those areas, it's addressing some of the key challenges that uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Mandrela and Ambassador Arriaga noted, which really cut across governance and questions of rule of law. They cut across violence and security. They cut across climate resilience and climate volatility. Um, I think to, to the point that was raised, and, and this gets to, um, to the question of governance from a private sector perspective, what are we hearing on the ground? In short, governance is a challenge. It's a major challenge when it comes to bringing private sector investments and opportunities in the region. The lack of certainty creates a challenge for businesses wanting to explore opportunities. And as Ambassador Ariaga noted, there is a need in large part for structural changes, structural changes which lie in the heart and the hands of of regional and local governments. There's also at the same time opportunities for businesses to take direct action to create a more transparent financial environment. And so this includes digitizing and moving toward electronic payments, as was noted from our colleague, moving to transparent systems that in many ways could shed light on the, the movement of the economy, the movement of funds across businesses. And I think importantly, what this also does, and it gets the idea of empowering individuals is it takes out the middleman and the opportunity for corruption. Shedding light on the movement of funds through digital payments, through electronic invoices, through many of the work and areas that MasterCard is driving globally when we think about uh, financial inclusion, reduces the risk of corruption and at the same time increases the opportunity for individual empowerment. And so in large part, when we think about the opportunity to reduce and to increase um, opportunities for governance and reduce the opportunities for, for corruption, Financial inclusion ends up being in large part at the heart of that. And so we're working with partners across uh, the region and globally, Consejo Nacional de Empresarios, Walmart, the National Law Center, Denton's Law, uh, MasterCard, of course, and, and in thinking about how we structure a opportunities for private sector organizations and civil society actors in the region to commit and to make progress within what is their control uh, to support a reduction in corruption. One of the areas that we're tactically uh, working on is a pledge to bring together uh, actors that are uh, agreeing on a common uh, vision for the region when we come to, to think about anti-corruption and we think about governance and rule of law practices. And that pledge really working with these civil society actors uh, and driven by our partners in the Partnership for Central America is targeting a set of very tactical actions as we think about short and long-term outcomes for some of these private sector actors in the region. It centers on many of the areas that we've discussed as we think about digital payments and electronic invoicing and other actions that within the private sector can increase transparency and, in, and reduce the opportunities for corruption. So I think in, in short, what it really comes to is a set of actions when we think about what this partnership is doing with a set of private sector partners across the region, a set of private sector organizations focused on seven core pillars of impact driving uh, a set of impact areas that are aimed at really delivering on Vice President Harris's vision for hope in the region. As we think about growing uh, to this audience, we very much welcome and hope to continue to grow in partnership with many of the organizations that are uh, in uh, and in attendance of this forum and hope that as we look ahead that we'll be able to build bridges and partnerships with each of you and your organizations. So I'll just say thanks very much, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary Mandrela, and again to the, to the foundation for, uh, for bringing us together, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, Maria Fernanda, I wanna bring you in. Um, 
you, as the, as the president of Guatemala's National Business Council, you are advocating for reforms that improve the business climate. Tell us uh, how increased transparency and improved rule of law could help Central America, and then tell us about some of your successes. Um, examples of how your member companies have encountered, um, have, have, have seen changes in the environment uh, around rule of law and transparency that have had a meaningful impact on their ability to attract investment or to achieve economic success. Okay, so thank you very much for this space. For us, it's a, it's a very good um, place to tell you about this because even though CNE is a very, it's a very young but fast-growing organization, uh, let me please tell you first about the kind of uh, problems that we have here in Guatemala so that uh, people can know what we're talking about. I'm going to give you three examples of problems that we have here. So uh, how bad economic governance and lack of transparency, rule of law, and we don't have an antitrust system, and this affects us. So the first one is the Fedecocawa case, uh, attacks on coffee exports and the governance of coffee exports institutions that primes big producers over efficient small producers. The largest federation of small producers organized into cooperatives have led the struggle to free the coffee expert from taxation, but they not only have they not been able to, they have been denied their identity as private sector by the constitutional court with the political aim of keeping them at bay from having a say and vote over monetary policy. And this was uh, during the Alvaro Colón administration. So it's, it's a problem that has been going on for a while. Another case is uh, the Hydro Pro case. Uh, a Guatemalan company that distributes an American brand of construction additives, which offers uh, the best performance at a fraction of the waterproofing cost is kept from growing in the Guatemalan market by the cement monopoly. Uh, how it does that? They refuse to extend the warranty over the pre-mixed uh, concrete if the client chooses to use products not distributed by the cement monopoly. Um, so the case extends to anyone trying to penetrate the Guatemalan market. The monopoly coerces uh, distributors with an exclusivity agreement that keeps our competitor, our competitors, sorry, out of the business in the retail market. So that's two of the examples. The third one uh, is the Mil Alas case, uh, which is my uh, company, a series of micro regulations over specific requirements met only by suppliers which with political or relational connections or willing to participate in corrupt payments to advance uh, their cases. And excessive and discretional bureaucratic steps keep a cocoa spirit startup, which is Milalas, from finalizing its constitution and, sta and start the operation. So it has been more than two years so that you can get a, an idea of what companies here in Guatemala go through. Not, not everyone can um, be have two years of, of these problems and still trying to, to start operations. So um, an example of how investment committed with good governance and business practices can create opportunities is two of our uh, members, uh, two Guatemalan coffee exporters, El Faro Estate Coffee and Fede Cocagua, uh, both members of CNE, as I said, uh, they are public champions of rule of law, the fight against corruption, reform of the economic governance, and who have audited practices that comply working conditions and environmental standards of the highest order, are the main suppliers of Nespresso, a, a company that has gravitated towards conscience, consumer practices, and have ESG as the forefront of their business decisions. So that would be one of our um, cases. Uh, it's They have been doing it for a while now, uh, but this can really be a, a difference. There are 23,000 small producers who sell to Nespresso, uh, even with all the problems that I told you before. Thanks so much, Maria Fernanda. And uh, I want to um, 
let folks know who are listening, at this point, we are gonna welcome questions from the audience. Please drop your questions into the comments chat and we'll, um, and we'll moderate those here. I will take the opportunity for the first, um, the, the first question while the comments are coming in. Um, to, to, to bring us back to the issue of um, transparency, I think we've all raised it in, in one respect or the other. Uh, I really liked the way that Jonathan put it, that you know, we're shining a light, we're increasing the opportunity for governance, and we are reducing the opportunity for corruption. Um, Masayo, you um, outlined very clearly the role that digitalization can play in the promotion of transparency. And I wanna pose a question, it's gonna be um, open-ended, but if no one jumps in, I'll direct it. Um, about how the private sector could uh, work with governments. Another theme that we've heard in this discussion today is the importance of public-private partnerships working together with the government to improve rule of law standards. So the question I'm gonna pose is how can the private sector support governments to perhaps identify, track, publicize, um, meeting a minimum standard, a minimum base of rule of law standards as an incentive for investment. Um, something that can be broadcast to companies around the world to attract investment, to say we have we have achieved the gold standard of, uh, of rule of law, or perhaps not the gold standard if we're, if we're opting for um, um, a, a minimum base that can say we have, we have achieved what is necessary to protect your investment. Um, we will, we are transparent about it. Uh, what are what are the opportunities to, for the private sector to to support governments in that way? What have you seen as best case examples, and um, and how could that be operationalized in Central America? Who wants to jump in? Masayo. You want to jump here, Mini? Yeah, I think definitely what we see from the private sector is private sector is the one that can bring innovation, that can bring resources expertise because we have been working toward these topics in different countries and we have the experience in order to bring these solutions alive. So I think um, when working with the private sector, it is critical for from our side to bring that solutions, to help to promote this uh, infrastructure, to promote um, digital solutions, digital payments. So all this knowledge that we already have, that we already work in other parts, understanding the specific needs of the countries that we are, where we are working. So definitely with the help of the government in terms of having the basic regulatory framework as um, a, it was posed by our opponents here, uh, we can bring these solutions and we can work leveraging our capacities and bringing the expertise from other countries. May I jump in? Sorry, my internet's shaky. Oh, okay, so I'm going to jump in. Uh, in the Central American context, not only Guatemala, as difficult as it may seem, the private sector must take a stronger position against uh, the government actions to dismantle the fight against corruption. Uh, and especially democratic crises have a direct effect on the competitiveness of markets. So permissive attitudes in the degradation of democracy sooner or later uh, affect business, even of those actors who seem to favor themselves temporarily. So the private uh, sector, CNE, and others should jump in and take a stronger position against uh, all the actions that are dismantling the, the fight against corruption um, in Guatemala and other countries. Maria Fernanda, I have a question for you, and I'm going to pose this also to Jonathan. Um, you know, we there, there are things that, that we are proposing that the private sector do to support or to partner with or to hold accountable governments in the region. What should organizations be doing on their own to help build a culture of good governance? Um, first to Maria Fernanda and then to, to Jonathan. Um, Central America is experiencing rough a rough patch in which a new institutional crisis is added to its, its historical problems that is undermining the quality of its democracies. Uh, in these types of small economies, the lack of competitive markets and systemic corruption are completely connected. Uh, without transparency and without mechanisms to enforce the law, 
the lo allocation of economic spaces, it's not a market choice, but a corrupt uh, politics. Uh, the greatest contribution private sector can generate is to raise the standard of compliance and assume real and public commitments uh, that reinforce the rule of law and transparency. New investments, of course, must be built on a compliance framework that takes into account clear positions that considers the, rep the reputation sorry, <laughs> of the company and its stakeholders, uh, its relations and positions in relation to the acts of government in Central America. Only actions of this type have the potential to generate appropriate incentives and to be sustained over time. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think I'd cut across two points, and it builds off of many of the comments that uh, that Ambassador Riaga and Masasayo have noted, uh, Maria Fernanda as well. There is a role for government, no doubt, in establishing and setting up an enabling environment. And without that enabling environment, it becomes very hard for private sector organizations to envision and to implement the, the hopes of any sort when it comes to governance and best practices. So that rule is very clear and across policy and the, the broader realms of, of the enabling environment that governments can create, that's a critical part to this. At the same time, I think to Deputy Assistant Secretary Mandrella's point, you know, there's, there are specific actions that private sector organizations can take and should take when it comes to operating an environment. The first that I'd offer perhaps is the coalition effect. So in as much as private sector organizations are able to group together around common visions of how they operate and value systems, that creates a very clear uh, coalition factor when it comes to uh, countering potential bad actors in any region globally, frankly. Those are private sector organizations who share values of transparency, who share values of, of workforce and worker protections, who share values that um, are aligned with many of the, the values that we've articulated on this conversation today. The second piece, I think, and this gets to Maria Fernanda's point, is the implementation and the action piece of that. And it's very much turning those value systems into public statements and public actions. And that's where it comes to measurement and evaluation part of this, where it's all fine and good to make major statements about values that you might have. But if at the end of the day, those values aren't turned into implemented actions on the ground when it comes to businesses on the, in their, in their uh, working environment, those statements and value statements sort of become uh, all for naught. So I think that second piece is really converting values and coalitions of values into actionable outcomes in the workforce and in the workplace. And that's something that we, uh, from a partnership perspective, are very focused on, on measuring and ensuring that those values are turned into action uh, across our partner organizations who, as, as an example, Maria Fernanda mentioned, uh, Nespresso, organizations who have very clear ESG and social uh, and environmental aspirations and goals for the region and are turning those into measurable outcomes when it comes to their workforce and their communities. Like a good governance club um, that has uh, shared values, statements of those shared values and demonstrated action to put to it as well, um, the, on which a spotlight can, can be shined. Um, I like that. Absolutely. Uh, Ambassador Ariaga, I um, I want to ask you um, if if I can to drill down on the role for the U.S. government in some of these um, uh, these efforts to promote investment, but investment that improves the governance climate in these countries, to promote transparency, um, and to do so through uh, through through foreign investment and the the good actions of of companies, um, global companies. What's what's the right role for the U.S. government in creating these partnerships, uh, working with local actors um, to ensure ownership of a transparent process and to foster policy su successes? Thanks for the question, Emily. Uh, in fact, I would say that uh, the U.S. government is already working on some of these policies. They have they are establishing funds that they intend to use to leverage other investment from the private sector, identifying some of the specific values, some of the specific objectives of this administration's uh, Central America policy. Uh, I am aware, for instance, when I was there, we started a project called Creating Economic Opportunities which basically invites the private sector to invest in specific areas, whether it is to generate employment, to increase productivity, and then the USAID would provide matching funds. 
I believe there are similar initiatives being considered right now. And that would be the one, I think that would be very helpful because for foreign corporations to have the US government imprimatur in an, in, 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 in an areas, in areas where they are not too, uh, they don't know too well, it, 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 it has a level of confidence. So I, I think this, this is something that is already being, being, being considered and, and being worked on. And that would be extremely, extremely welcome. And also, I do know that the, the uh, USA, for instance, has been working on the open government uh, platform, which little by little is being bringing transparency to the budget making process, to the budget execution process in some government institutions, not all of them, but that is moving in the right direction. Thank you. And that's perhaps a good segue to a question that was in the chat um, a few minutes ago um, about the role of the philanthropic community. Um, I, I know we've spent a lot of time talking about the role of the private sector, the um, exhortations of the government to um, bring about reform. There's a really important role, too, for other actors um, in civil society, in the broader philanthropic community. Um, would anyone, I, I, I hesitate to assign this one, but would anyone like to take a stab at what you see as opportunities right now for the philanthropic community to participate in this discussion? I'm, I'm happy to uh, take that one, Emily. You know, as, as we think about this this ecosystem, the private sector at the end of the day is one part of a much larger group of, of partners. And f to be effective in any space, frankly, whether it's in Central America and Northern Central American countries uh, or elsewhere, this ecosystem of players have to work together. And there's a shared vision and opportunity here. Now, there's a there's a, a, a challenge here that goes beyond what any single company, what any single uh, sector can do. And so in thinking about the, I think the tactical response, in the same way that the private sector is leveraging their comparative advantages, that is to say, their ability to build and create jobs and their ability to build and create integration into the economic system and the financial systems of any economy, the, um, the philanthropic sector similarly has the opportunity to, uh, to build off of their comparative advantage to really deploy resources, as well as to build a, an ecosystem or clustering effect of interest in a region. So you look at some of the, the largest uh, philanthropies that are operating globally, and you, you view the opportunity for some of those actors to deploy resources at a larger scale in this region uh, across key areas of, of growth, whether it's agriculture, financial inclusion, uh, digital inclusion, and the like. And that's where you start to, I think, see a, a very significant level of scalable potential impact. And so I take, for example, digital inclusion as a case study. This is a spot where uh, Microsoft Foundation and Microsoft Philanthropies, for example, are actively working on deploying internet access to 4.5 million households across the Northern Central American country, uh, Northern Central American region, uh, as part of this, this effort and the, the partnership that is assembled. That, though, is a, a sort of single point of this much larger spectrum of light that's, that is focused on this digital inclusion. There are private sector actors. There's Microsoft's uh, for-profit function here. There are government actors. So I think the, the takeaway really is that, and it's, it's such a key point that uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary Andrela points, and that is that beyond the private sector, uh, inclusive of government, there is an entire ecosystem of players who, unless they work together, you really cannot even imagine the, the level and scale of impact that we're discussing here that is required to really shift some of the key challenges that the region faces. Thanks a lot for that that question. I see the, the philanthropic sector is kind of force multipliers of the Good Governance Club that we talked about earlier, um, expanding that beyond just the, the private sector actors and taking it across all sectors. Um, uh, that's an important uh, an, an important point and an important role that they play, um, especially right now. Uh, I I want to take us um, into um, the topic of, of certainty. Um, I think we all know that it takes time for investors to react to signals generated by economic policies because they, they're going to want confidence that policies won't be reversed. We see it here. We see 
I think I'm back. Sorry, my internet cut out. Um, how can the private sector um, educate policymakers that that that's needed? Um, and and uh, what does that conversation look like between um, the private sector and policymakers to bring about that certainty that that investors are going to want, um, even though election imperatives and other political Nobody took it while I was gone? <laughs> I will pose that question uh, to Ambassador Ariaga. You got uh, that, Millie. Yes, uh, actually, I, mean, I do believe that the Guatemalan private sector stands the current situation. And uh, they are in their own way trying to address it, but I fear it is not going far enough. Uh, the perception the, the perception is that they are supporting the current state of affairs and and if that person is out there sometimes perception becomes reality and and so i i think that uh whether they do it in private conversations uh, they must uh express their views not necessarily publicly uh, there is a situation in Guatemala where you have a, an attorney general that has been designated as corrupt by the U.S. government. Well, that's, that's a pretty serious situation. And, and there have been some suggestions that the private sector is, doesn't necessarily agree with the U.S. government. And that presents, a, presents an issue. And, and maybe they don't agree, but it, the perception is that they do agree. So I, I think there's more than they can do. I'm not suggesting that they go out and become uh, political actors, especially for the uh, U.S. private sector. But I think uh, the messages must be transmitted privately uh, that uh, this is serious and that the issues that have been identified about policy requirements, regulatory requirements, rule of law requirements really must be met and that there must be some signs that there is a true commitment. Uh, about uh, to 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 address to to bring foreign investment and to you know work for the prosperity of the country. Um, Maria Fernanda, same same question to you. Um, how can uh, the private sector and other actors, frankly, educate policymakers um, on the need for certainty of policy and consistency in policy in order to attract uh, attract foreign investment? Thank you, Emily. Well, yeah, I agree with Ambassador Arreaga. The private sector does understand how the government actions affect their conditions, and they have opted to be permissive with the political sector. Yeah, it's not only the impression, but yes, at the expense of the claims of civil society. Uh, so it's necessary for the private sector to identify the potential to bet on building bridges with the actors seeking a true reform agenda. Um, economic conditions are not sustainable in the region, the indicators aren't good to attract investment. Uh, so the private sector must be must bet on empirical evidence and understand that reforms are essential, uh, that every future uh, path starts from accompanying policymakers with a reform agenda that improves access to credit, free competition, productivity, and job creation. Thanks a lot, Maria Fernanda. Um, I have a, a question um, for Jonathan. Um, I, I wonder if you can tell, oh, I'm sorry, Masayo, did you wanna hop in on that? Yeah, I wanna jump here and just um, like to share the experience that we have had in, the, in other countries. For instance, in Colombia, we were questioning the way uh, the government was paying, for instance, subsidies. We were working with them in showing new ways of doing things. So I think we need to keep pushing, pushing, pushing in promoting or proposing new ways of doing things. And for instance, one thing that I found like really, really strategic here and has worked very, very well is the deployment of sandbox in order to understand the possibilities of different changes in regulation that can allow and that propose different ways of doing things. So the way of working with sandbox and pilot different strategies in order to show government how to do things in a different matter uh, or a different way has been critical in different sectors to really promote new ways. For instance, we changed the way or we with our partners, of course, with the 
fintech that are in the in the region, we changed the way um, financial cost and financial structure were deploying and were de developing the country, and we allow to have new ways of providing services free of charge for impost for the users. And any way like uh, it has to be. Um, it has to have a return for the for the investors, definitely, uh, but uh, and for the for the shareholders. But finding new ways of doing things and pushing the government in showing them new ways of doing of doing uh, these solutions. So I think sandbox and like really trying to find new ways is critical via regulation and a pilot. That's really interesting. And while I've got you on the screen, I want to ask you a question of, about something that we have talked around but haven't addressed explicitly in this conversation, and that's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the role of, of digitalization, how do you see digitalization efforts um, advancing the uh, the cause of diversity, equity, inclusion that, that from the U.S. government perspective, we see as fundamental to the success of rule of law efforts generally? It's a big statement, but we mean it. Um, and I wonder if you can address that from the, the perspective of, 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 of digitalization efforts. Sorry, I got out. Can you repeat it, Emily? Sorry. Sure, no, that's okay. Um, uh, <laughs> digital tools and the way that those can advance diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts around the world, but specifically in Central America. Yeah, sure, definitely. We have been working in how can we empower beyond digitalization different actors and different, um, and how can we provide, for instance, um, gender, equi gender equality in different strategies. So we have found that when you provide the tools, when you work with women in providing solutions and giving them the right um, uh, a, a, a payment and helping them to really seek the return on the investment and the way women really deploy this this strategies is super super uh, it has a great impact in the economy why because women revert the investment in the, into society they try to help these people that have been um a, a how do you say excluded from the system they really try to bring women into the conversation they really help and pay on time so we think that providing the tools for women in terms of digital solutions in terms of helping them to be part of them for instance i, I go back to the fintech ecosystem has been critical in opening new ways of solutions and having like a critical impact in terms of social and economical um opportunities. Um, that's that's great. Thank you very much for that. So the final question before we close is uh, going to go to Jonathan. I want to hear more about this pledge. Um, tell us about what it is that you're um, that you're thinking about, how you're going to convince co uh, uh, companies to come along, what impact you think that will have. Yeah, th thank you. And, and again, just thank you so much to the foundation and to State Department and, uh, and to you, Emily, for hosting this. You know, we're on a shared journey here, frankly, and it's one in which each of us, I think, as an organization, as a sector, play a role in in, in achieving a long-term vision for the region. Um, that cuts across a number of areas. We, we heard from Masayo of, about financial inclusion, from Ambassador Ariaga about the rule of law and the broader pieces here and some of the tactical challenges from Maria Fernanda that, we've, that we see on the ground. Uh, this pillar of governance at the end of the day, from a private sector perspective, ends up being something that private sector organizations working together can make a decision to act in a, in a form that, as, as Emily, you noted, is really consistent with a good governance club. And that is to say, consistent with a set of values that we share uh, as organizations across private sector, across philanthropy, across governance, across governments, pardon me, who, uh, who believe in transparency and an open approach to, to doing business. And so what this pledge really is very tactically is establishing that good governance club, as you put it. It's establishing a group of players who together are committed to a set of values that are consistent with open and transparent business practices, following best international standards. And it's applying those in very tactical ways to digital payments, to electronic invoicing, and to open and creating transparent uh, approaches to how businesses work. So this pledge is really an effort to bring together organizations who, who believe in these values and want to apply these values in a very tactical and real way on the ground. And they're measurable ways. 
They ensure that these are that, are, that these businesses are being held accountable uh, for these values statements that they're that they're putting out there. So as we think about this, we encourage anyone and everyone on this call and elsewhere to to please come to us and to uh, to engage us and how we can engage uh, your organizations and others to join this this pledge of good governance in the region. Thanks very much for that. 30 seconds of final comments for the rest of the panelists before we close. Uh, first over to you, Ambassador Ariaga. Just let me repeat my mantra. Governments don't have to do everything at the same time, but they do have to show some credible uh, signs that they are committed to reforms. Masayo. Yes, thank you, Emily. No, we are committed definitely with digitalization. We think that we can work with governments in providing new way of doing things. And you have all our commitment in working on those topics for promoting financial inclusion and a complete digital ecosystem. Maria Fernanda. The greatest contribution that private sector can generate is to raise the standard of compliance and assume real and public commitments that reinforce the rule of law and transparency in Central America. At the beginning is that the U.S. government has focused its efforts to address root causes of migration in Central America in several pillars. Um, and we tend to, as a U.S. government, be very bureaucratic in that respect, that we are organized along several work streams and lines of effort. Uh, I do want to stress that in the case of governance, anti-corruption, transparency, democracy, it is a cross-cutting effort across all pillars. And we absolutely see the efforts that each of you are doing to promote investment in Central America as being critical, critical, critical to the um, to our efforts um, collectively um, across civil society, um, across governments, um, across private sector actors, the philanthropic community to raise the standard as Maria Fernanda just put. I, um, I wanna thank you again, a huge thanks to the Central American Donors Forum for the opportunity to have this conversation. Look forward to continuing it um, in several other fora as well. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon.